If you want to paint emotion, you want to paint feeling, this is the place to be because that's what's going on here. Yeah, I want to paint this Appalachia scene. There's a, to me, there's a lot of, I don't want to say misery, but there's a lot of the economy's bad right now. And I think it's, it emotionally affects me. I think it shows my work and the paintings I'm doing. So I think I want to kind of concentrate on the life around here, life in this area in our state and the whole Appalachia region. The one that I had in the Jurors show, which is the Friends of Fossilized Carbon, I was in a group that traveled to Logan, you know, look at the coal fields and talk to people in the industry, and it was so depressing. And when I came back, I just had this emotional charge that I, I had to do something related to that. Like most artists, you've probably painted 10,000 paintings in your head and maybe a thousand of them in your lifetime will get down on canvas if you're lucky. So I'm trying to take what pops into my head and immediately either take notes or sketch something down to leave myself a, a trail of thoughts. And then when I'm ready to get in front of the canvas to work something out, then I'll, I kind of can review back over those things and see what, what it is I thought about that day. So everything I do, whether it looks, whether people grasp it or not, I have some a concept behind the pieces when I get started. So I want to connect, I want to have a visual connection between what's going on here and what's going on back here to, to highlight this area. For instance, I, the one I have on, the, on my uh, easel now, I was just driving my daughter to school and I, I saw a tree with these like vultures just all sitting in the same tree. It just kind of connected with me that it kind of reflected um, my daughter's future and the things they're going to have to go through. It's kind of a, a dreary type thing of it. I'm always concerned about what the world's going to be like when they get to be an adult. I'm, I'm influenced a lot by Hopper and uh, Andrew Wyeth, but I came, we went to a show and we were uh, parked in a parking garage down in Charleston. And this is, uh, this is Hale Street. So the, the, all this activity was going on in Hale Street and it's just kind of made me think about how the, the city of Charleston, it, to me, there's not, it seems to be dying. And it just wanted to have this concept of, the name of this one's Ode to a Dying City, and have this lone figure here pointing to the heart of the, of, the, of the city. And there's some activity going there, but really the rest of it is kind of dead. My oldest daughter, Susanna, was asleep on the couch. And I, was just kind of... I find myself being drawn to more conceptual ideas and, and thoughts, and I, I think that's where I'm heading. It's important for me to, to have my paintings mean something. Um, your face is almost like a mask. You're still dreaming and your face is a mask for your subconscious. A painting of my brother, for instance, I thought he was asleep. Well, you know, it looks that way to me because I knew that's what he was doing when I was painting him, but, you know, I wanted it to be dark and I wanted it to be some bright light kind of reflecting off him. Maybe he is contemplating, I think the contemplation of green was the name I put to it. So I wanted people to have some, uh, I just don't want to have a painting of a person sleeping. I want them to think maybe they are thinking something deep and heavy. And, I want to leave a mark. I want, when I'm gone, I just want my relatives to have a piece of what I created. If I get it, if I get a name for that after I'm gone or while I'm here, then that's that's gravy on that. But you know, I just want to. I have something to say, and I like to say it. And I think when you do it in art, it it, it lives beyond you, and it'll be here hopefully for a couple hundred years afterwards. So.
My interest in history predated my interest in wood, but it was when the two came together, by accident, really, that I realized, wow, I'm onto something, because I love history, I love telling stories, and I love making things with my hands. Why not try a unique way of telling or retelling history? And it's not just history writ large, it's also personal stories. I mean, that's really what started. It was families approaching me and saying, we lost this tree, and we love this tree. Could you make something for me out of it? The preparation, though, to do a piece really starts with the chainsaw out in a wooded area or the fields. And of course, all the wood needs to be dried, so the, really the first phase is rough turning it and then coming back to it later. So in that sense, it takes months, but the actual turning of a finished piece um, is not, uh, it's not a long process and it's, uh, it's, things happen pretty fast. It's important to me to see past flaws or what other people might consider to be deficiencies somehow. And in fact, sometimes I like to highlight those things. Flaws, I think, often contribute to the beauty and complexity of both a person and a tree, a piece of wood. I use only local hardwoods um, that I've harvested myself. With all these trees around us and all this downed wood and available wood, there must be beauty here that we're just not seeing. And I love finding a tree that people don't often associate with beautiful turnings, hackberry, um, linden, beautiful trees, but the wood isn't necessarily considered gorgeous. I like to find that one crotch piece or that odd piece and try to get something out of that. And frankly, sometimes there's a piece of wood that just isn't that character laden, but its provenance makes it interesting. So I have a piece from, say, Mount, uh, Mount Vernon. A pecan was taken down in Mount Vernon. The one piece I did, it was all sap wood, so it's not this beautiful colored wood. So I made a more interesting shape out of it. So I let the wood do the talking but um, sometimes I have to make it a little more interesting. I think that I've always known um, that, I was, that I had to be involved in something creative, but I really stumbled on the wood thing by accident. I was making maple syrup at the time, local maple syrup, and branches kept falling from the maple trees and I was so intrigued by the wood I started to carve on it, whittle on it, and um, made walking sticks, things like that. And then one day out of the blue, I don't know why, but I bought a lathe um, through the mail. And I turned it on, started making mistakes, and I was hooked. I call it the sickness. I had the sickness. And um, that was about eight years ago. And it's been no looking back ever since. When I think about the future, when I think about where this might be going, I realize I found my home. I, I found what I believe I was meant to do. Very optimistic about the future because I think I found a kind of a unique way of, of expressing or telling that history. And where does that end? I mean, it just next connection, next connection. And I don't know, um, I don't know where I'll be in 10 years, but I'm pretty certain I'll be turning wood from some interesting place and trying to tell the story about it.
you can't really force rhododendron and ironwood to do something you don't want to. It's fun to let the wood talk to you. I started working with my dad building houses and then one summer I was looking through a book and there was a chapter on building rustic twig furniture. So when I was 15 years old, I went out in my backyard and cut down a few trees and made my first chair. My favorite type of wood is rhododendron and ironwood. Rhododendron has a lot of great characters. It's hard to find a straight piece, so it, it talks to me and tells me what it wants to do and has great coloration. Ironwood's another fun wood because its texture on the outside and coloration is really fun to play with and it sands really nicely and smooth. Ten years ago I got tenon cutters to help me make the end piece. So this will cut that just like a big pencil sharpener will go on the end and cut it. So that helped out a lot. I used to use a chisel and make that round and it took a while and my joints weren't really tight. So at this point, yeah, I can throw together a chair and pretty quickly. Rhododendron's really funky. These, this is ironwood, so it's a little bit straighter, but sometimes the legs kicked way out, so that'll tell me where this piece needs to end up. Like this is a curvy piece, so I need to try to keep it in line with where this line sticks out in the leg. The other leg will be up here, so this just tells me where the rung needs to go. Just one side of the legs to a bedside table. Yeah, I say the wood talks to me when I go out into the woods and I see a, I see a tree, I see what it might want to be, either a bed or it has a neat kick out at the bottom, it could be a neat chair leg or... Yeah, I, I'm always walking around looking at trees and seeing how it could be used for a neat piece of wood or neat furniture. And... I do enjoy the outdoors, so yeah, I like to bring anything from outdoors inside, so when I make a piece of furniture, either a headboard or a chair, it's nice to bring the outdoors in during the winter or even the summer when it's hot. Yeah, yeah, I have a small house, so I, I do like practical items, I, and if it's practical and also beautiful and great to look at it, it's definitely an addition. I took a basket weaving course and it was just a fun 
activity that I did. And that's probably been about 25 years ago. And once I took that class, I was hooked. I absolutely loved making baskets. It has stayed in my blood. There's something about this art medium that has really stuck with me. When I started making traditional baskets, I wanted to get the background of those. Part of that was doing the research myself, but also part of that, from a curriculum point of view, was doing the research with the students. So we learned about different kinds of baskets. We learned about where baskets originated, how baskets are made out of different, very different kinds of materials in different parts of the country, based on what is available. You might have baskets in the South made out of pine needles or the sweetgrass baskets that are made in South Carolina. Uh, you have traditional oak or reed baskets made in more of the Appalachian area. So wherever people were living, they had to make baskets based on what was available because the baskets were necessary. I had not taken another class since that very first one 25 years ago. I've been pretty much self-taught, reading, um, you know, just, just observing. When I start on a basket, I find myself losing track of time. I love working where I work. I work in my home. I work basically out of my kitchen, but I do that because I have tremendously great light. I have a view out my windows of the woods and the animals and the birds and the snow and the wind and the rain, but I do lose complete track of time. It's being formed by your hands and you can change it at any time um, on a whim. And there's just the possibilities are endless for an outcome. With my baskets and what I see down the road or in my future, I think my real goal is that I continue to love doing what I do. If it becomes a job, then it's no longer fun. I get up every morning and I'm excited to start on a new basket or to continue weaving on a basket. That's what I want to hold on to. I want that freshness, that love, that energy to go into every basket that I make. And always try to have, at the very least, one thing you love, one thing you have loved, and, perhaps most importantly, one thing you will someday love. Sometimes the blessings of this world became so much for Gerard that the only thing he could think to do was climb into a hot air balloon and go throw flowers into the mountains.
I started drawing randomly, and one day I just started doodling on a piece of paper, and uh, thus began a, a slight passion for drawing in the beginning, and then it kind of snowballed. When I started drawing, they were stick men in the beginning. That was, that was what I drew, and that was the whole series for, for quite some time. It was a stickman series. And eventually, after just you know repetitive action, I became a little bit better, and I, it started to seem a little absurd to keep drawing stickmen. So I just slowly, you know, one day their eyes became not little dots, but like a dot in a circle, and then not a dot in a circle, but a dot in a circle and a little another line that made an eyelid, and then eventually their bodies kind of filled out. I attempt to create images that, and worlds and creatures that are at once profound and silly at the same time. And I, I do that because I think that most of the lessons that I've learned in my life that I've counted as most valuable are at once silly and profound. And I think that's the whole of life. The movement from the illustration series into the Melted Crayon series came basically from just a desire to switch up medium in kind of almost a brain stimulation exercise. They're entirely different. I think I engage different parts of myself when I um, interact with those pieces. One is very narrative and the other one is much more abstract. You know, a lot of times it just starts with a color. You just start with one color and, and a blank canvas. And then as it evolves, I start to come up with a plan. See, that's gonna take quite a few crayons, getting that guy to stick. I relate to all of the different mediums that I use in a completely different way. So it really depends on how I'm feeling that day. If I want to be more abstract and not be so narrative and conceptual, then I'm going to move towards the crayon art. If I want to sit there at a desk hunched over and do just kind of turn my brain off a little bit, that's the drawing stuff a lot. At the same time, I've realized that it's really important for me personally just to be, just to be able to have as much time as I want to make art and not have any other goal than that going into the creative process. That'll do. There is a moment where I can step back from it and look at it more as something that I've created separate from the creative process and realize that I do, I do want exposure for that. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with the way I watch people interact with it when they're in my gallery. Whether blind and grasping beneath the sliver of a moon, or whether wild and burning straight into the sun, keep looking everywhere and always for that one thing you will someday love. I simply want to be able to make art more than I do anything else. I want to not have to do anything else except for make art. I mean, of course, there's many other things that I want to do, but I don't necessarily have any other trajectory that I'm aiming for other than that.